So what I want to do is first go through, how many of you have read the, uh, the blog series that I've been kind of working on about, okay? Um, you, I, I'm, just, I'm going to go through some of that material because I think it's a good starting place. And then we're going to get to what the issues are right now in the Drupal community and just kind of walk through those. And your, your input is very welcome. Um, and then I'd like to do a little brainstorming about what, what you think we should do. And I'd like to come out with some concrete, um, some concrete ideas of how we can uh, how we can build going forward. In other words, what I'd like to have be the outcome of this today is not, we're not going to design Drupal's new governance today. That's not, I'd like to come out with a concrete plan though that would put into place something that would help us to build more structure into our governance that is in line with our culture. So I would like to come out with a concrete plan and I think we can uh, do that in this in this time that we have a plan to build a plan kind of thing, right? So What's that? Planning to plan. Yeah, just uh, and uh, I, 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 We can bike shed about this today, but uh, <laughs> No smoking craters, that's right, so the um, the actual presentation is hidden by this little slide thing here, but it's lb.cm slash governance. And uh, that is writable right now by everybody. Um, so if you see, especially as we get to the end, if you see something that we need to add to that, you're welcome to. But um, you probably don't have to because Melissa agreed to scribe. So she'll be adding to that. Um, as, as necessary, especially those later slides where we try to write down what we're thinking as a group. So, okay, so I have always avoided kitten slides, but now I am one, right? You know, so <laughs> they were just too good. So I, I just want to say that no matter what problems we might have, the idea that open source communities are able to create incredible things through voluntary collaboration of people all over the world is absolutely astonishing. And it has to be one of the greatest things to happen in this world in the last 30 years. I mean, do you read about that in the newspaper? Does that go up there with Iran and nuclear threats and stuff like that? I mean, it is as important as Iran and nuclear threats on the opposite side. And you're involved in that, and that is absolutely fantastic. I don't think that anybody should take for granted the idea that we are already collaborating and doing beautiful things. I want us to do it better, but we're already doing beautiful things, and all those other communities are also doing great things. So if you don't know what governance is, um, it's just a fancy word for how we make uh, decisions how we organize ourselves, how we plan together, how we make a decision when we make a plan, and of course, how we resolve conflicts. And if you know anything about government in the country type sense, you know that governance as an institution only works as well as the culture behind it works. And if you now, in your own country, you have probably seen some issues with that. In the United States, we have these culture wars that have brought our government to, uh, to a halt. It's a very disturbing kind of thing, but culture and the formal structures of governance have to go together. And so as we think through these things, we always have to keep the culture in mind because the governance is just an afterthought if the culture isn't working. So I know that we all, value our, uh, we all value our culture and that we'll all be thinking that way, but that is a critical, critical idea. So culture plus process. Governance lets us have some consistency, some idea of what's going to happen when and why it might happen that way. Uh, lets us accomplish shared objectives, lets us resolve conflicts and do things more efficiently. I think 
that we can just keep going forward. So I put down a list as I was studying uh, various open source communities of some of the distinctives that they have and how they work. Um, each one has its own culture, and of course we all know how we value ours. Some of them have a membership concept, so we don't have that, but Debian and Ubuntu have a very, very specific membership step where you become a member. Uh, Debian has a developer step beyond that, uh, which is the commit privilege kind of step, which is very interesting. Um, a lot of cultures have a, a founder uh, who has kept the dictator role. Um, if you laugh when I say benevolent dictator for life, which many people do when they first hear that, it's actually just a kind of a standard statement, you know, it's like it's already, it's something that's used widely in the open source world. Some of these have a, com a sponsoring commercial entity, which we don't, um, or at least we claim we don't. Um, and some of them have really defined structure and leadership, and some of them have nearly nothing. So we'll just take a quick look at some of them. Debian is absolutely amazing because if you read their many government governance documents, the first thing they say is like, nobody can make you do anything. So there. It's like, that's like the first line of the Constitution. It's like, <laughs> you know, it basically says nobody can make you do anything. If you don't want to do anything, you don't have to do anything. But don't be in anybody else's way is what it basically says. But, it's like, wow, okay, and so then they go on and they have this enormously structured governance that goes into great depth and that seems to work pretty well. Um, they have a social contract, they have a philosophy of open software, they have a constitution, they have positions and they have elected leaders. Um, you probably can't see this very well, but it gives you some idea of the hierarchy and who makes whom. They have a project leader who is elected, who's not there forever. They, it gets elected every, I don't know how often. Um, they, have, uh, they have teams and secretaries and just, it, it, it's, it's just fascinating. It's very, very impressive. KDE, which is smallish, has nada. It, it, they're, they're, they're like us, kind of, um, except that we have Dries. But they basically have, just do it. it. They have a rule. We have some rules, you know, like uh, we call ourselves a duocracy. They probably call themselves that, too. Um, they have a rule that says that if you're doing the work, you get to make the decisions. And that is a, um, they're a smaller community and they do occasionally have deadlock like we occasionally have, but they have no way out of it. They have one committee whose job is if somebody gets really mad, there, there's a, 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 an attempt at conflict resolution. And that's, that's about it. If you go looking for, re, for governance on the uh, KDE site, you'll find about as much as if you're looking for governance on the Drupal site. Um, you, you just won't. I, I, pr I probably mentioned that I, I searched the internet for Drupal governance, and all I found was this thing at DrupalMyths.com that denied that Drupal had little governance. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, and and it, that does have something to do with the word governance not being necessarily the word that's used in all cases where we're talking about governance, but it's still pretty funny. You know, it's like, the only thing you can find is something that denies that you don't have an issue with that kind of thing. Wikipedia, which um, you can think of easily as an open source community, it's just that the source is content, um, is, has a benevolent dictator for life, but interestingly enough, even though he's like this super funder, founder guy, his, um, his, Prerogatives have been limited over the years. And of course, they have quite an amazingly large community, and his role in it has been occasionally controversial. But they have, um, they, he, he or they or something have actually rolled back 
in, with specifics what he has the power to do. And he still has an impressive set of roles, but it's, it's, it's very interesting to see that. They have a constitution, but their big thing is solving, uh, solving conflicts at the page level. Because have you guys ever seen one of those big conflicts on Wiki Wikipedia where, you know, like the George Bush page or something like that where everybody has a different opinion and they have to sort it out? They've got that down to a, they've got that particular issue of governance sorted out to where they have the technology to do it on the talk page next to it. And they have the procedures to do it. Um, I, I, I just think it's, very impressive that they've worked that out at that level. Ubuntu has very, very impressive level of governance. And of course, we and KDE and everybody else you can think of have snarfed their well thought out code of uh, conduct. So the Ubuntu code of conduct with minor changes becomes the Drupal code of conduct except that we don't have any of the structures that they use to resolve conflicts and that sort of thing. Um, so we punt on that part. Um, they have a, a benevolent dictator. They have a commercial sponsor, like a lot of the communities. Uh, they have, a, you know, a, a lot of people will say about WordPress or about Ubuntu, oh, it's all about canonical or oh, it's all about automatic. It's absolutely not true as far as I can tell in either case. Both of them are very established, very um, functional, and I would imagine also dysfunctional uh, open source communities. But they both seem, from a casual glance from the outside, to be very, very functional, well thought out, and real open source communities, not puppets for some sponsoring commercial organization. Um, so uh, I think I've heard that many times said about uh, WordPress.org but as I read about them and, and watch their videos and stuff, I, I don't think it's true. I think that they are a very established um, open source community. Um, Ubuntu has the membership concept. Uh, it has a community manager, uh, Jono Bacon, who's one of the very widely well thought of thinkers in the governance and community and community organizing uh, view, that whole world there. Um, he has a book, by the way, and there's the reference to the book. It's a free book. The reference is on the blog post. Um, his book is well worth reading, and there's a, chap a full chapter on governance and a full chapter on conflict resolution that are very well informed, uh, very well thought out. Ubuntu has specific conflict resolution because they have a way to do it. They have a technical committee that can make technical decisions, and they have a some kind of a community committee that can make community decisions and solve those kind of things. WordPress um, has a uh, sponsoring commercial entity, has a real community, and has a very, has a very specific org chart with lieutenants and that sort of thing. Uh, and it has a, you know, if you've been around Drupal for very long, you know that Dries has a very, very light touch. Um, and that's one of the characteristics of our community. And, and I think it's a, I think it's a defining thing that is a part of why our community is what it is. I think it's a beautiful thing. Um, Matt Mullenweg is very explicit about direct, he's very directive. He says, this is what we're doing. Get to it. And they, they basically they say to new contributors, hey, you know, like, if you don't like what Matt wants to do, you might want to go to some other community, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to say, uh, but a very different style than Drupal. And of course, the Linux kernel is, a, is the most famous of all open source communities, but it's a, kind of a narrow kind of thing. Um, like, I don't think that I could get a patch into Linux kernel without working on it for a few years. You know, get yourself into their, has anybody done any work on the kernel? It, what, it, how did it work? So, so just to get a, a fix in that's obvious was 
the, it was clear how to do it, but it's like patches in a, in a mailing list, stuff like that. You know, it's, it's very different from our huge community with lots and lots of people. And I get the impression it's more vertical, uh, most of the work, you know, especially features. Um, okay, so then there's us, and uh, we're, uh, we're a lot like uh, some of the others. We have a be benevolent dictator. We have a tradition of gentle leadership or, um, or cat herding only leadership sometimes. Uh, where we have leadership, a lot of times it's only, uh, rather than leading, it's uh, grouping or trying to get people to do things or that kind of thing. Um, we have the new initiative lead experiment, which is a great new uh, step in core development where we have um, some lieutenants, what, five? Five lieutenants? Some. We have some lieutenants who um, have some kind of leadership invested in them, and we don't exactly know what at this point, but we, there is some kind of leadership invested in them. Um, are, we have words that we use like consensus and like duocracy that are very important, but can mean a whole bunch of different things. Consensus can mean that anybody can block any issue. Um, it can also mean that you can do something if nobody's looking. Um, a duocracy can mean the very, very empowering sense of if something needs to be done, I can go do it, which is very powerful. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. It's a, suckered me into uh, quite a number of problems. <laughs> like, like this one. <laughs> um, yeah, because I can propose a core conversation and, and poke at our governance structure, and I think it's important, here I am. Um, we have the Drupal Code of Conduct, which says a lot about our culture, but has no teeth because we don't have much governance structure. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a, it, it, it was a trial balloon and it, it stayed up and it's there at drupal.org slash DCOC and it's the same as Ubuntu's, except that we don't have really any way to institutionalize what it says. Um, we don't have any conflict resolution model at all. There are a few people who try to solve problems um, our most famous one is in the front row on my left. Um, Acquia is not, uh, it is explicitly names itself as not a sponsoring commercial organization. And that's probably a matter of, uh, you know, it should be conversed, but I don't know whether, it, I don't think it probably has to do with this conversation today, but it uh, obviously, Drees with, Drees with his agenda as project lead and Drees with money at his disposal in the office of the CTO probably has a specific power that nobody else has. Um, and that doesn't need to be viewed badly. Um, and the Drupal Association, a lot of people think that the Drupal Association is Drupal's um, constitution or governance or whatever, but it's just not true. Uh, the Drupal Association does have governance itself, uh, but it is in charge of money and it's in charge of events. That's it, right? Well, that's money, right? Money because of only infrastructure as it has to do with money. So, um, so the Drupal Association can affect the Drupal community by where it puts money. That's a, that's very similar to Acquia because Acquia gets to choose where it puts money. It can have an impact on the community. Um, but it, um, so the, the Drupal Association is, Drupal Association is not Drupal. It is not the community. It is not the development uh, community, none of that. So uh, that, that's a little hard to sort out. I mean, uh, it was only like last year that I realized that, so. Yeah, yeah, Joseph. So the question is, does the, does the DA control like our 
actual uh, Drupal.org or the associate uh, that um, only in so much as they fund the servers and and they put some funding into the the care for the servers and they put some funding into new initiatives. So yes, they could turn it off by not paying for it, but essentially no, um, if they got weird, um, we would just figure out a way and, and it'd be gone. You know, it'd be off of their, out of their world. So if the, if the DA got dysfunctional and started saying, hey Drupal, you better do thus and such, well, uh, the, the community can just change. My, it, it's not likely to happen, so. But it's, I'm, I'm speaking true, right? Yep. You, you want to say something? You say it. <laughs> just, just on the topic of the Drupal Association, because I'm on the board of the Drupal Association, so the Drupal Association explicitly in its uh, like constitution, or whatever you call it, um, does not control the project, does not control the community, does not do any of that stuff. We try and just basically handle the things that have to be handled by an infrastructure or an organization with money. Um, you know, like DrupalCon is really hard to get a bunch of scrappy developers together and like, let's just pool our money together and get like $800,000 and throw this huge event. Sorry? I'm sorry, yes. So uh, we, you know, we basically try and limit the powers of the DA around only the things that the community can't rally around and do themselves. And in terms of Drupal.org, I have a talk tomorrow about that. Um, and it's, we're, we're edging our way into like helping Drupal.org more because this is what we're hearing from the community that they want more support, but definitely not a we control the project kind of thing at all. Um, we, we, we pay for the servers, but there is a huge infrastructure team of like 30 plus volunteers that maintains that stuff. Um, and we fund certain initiatives like the Git migration, the Drupal.org redesign, again, things that can't be sort of done through a grassroots mechanism, so. Thank you very much. Okay, so before we look at some of the oopsies about Drupal's um, governance situation right now, um, we need to acknowledge what is absolutely fantastic. And I mean, we're all here because it's absolutely fantastic. We have, uh, you know, like, like I was saying, it's a duocracy. You have this preemptive power vested in you that if you can just figure out how things work, you can just do it. Um, as we said before, it's worked a long time. We have a great community. And we have this, um, uh, Ethel Jensia pointed out in the comments on one of the blog posts, that we have this culture of peer review that, that we should never lose. Uh, whether or not we add structure, the peer review is great power. And of course, multiple minds working on something. It can mean designed by committee, but it can also be fantastic in resolving things in a wonderful way by people collaborating, really actually truly collaborating. So, now I do have a list of problems, um, as, you might, <laughs> as you might have guessed that I would. Um, as with any place where everybody can do their own thing, we can often have a, a lack of, and by the way, you're welcome to add to this list and, and we'll just add to it. Um, there can be a real lack of strategic fo focus. As the kind of person who gets suckered into um, just working on what he sees is a problem, um, I used to do that in core a lot. Every time I'd come to a bug, or a thing that I didn't like how it worked, I would take that on and I would open an issue and I'd try to make a patch and all that kind of thing. Well, is that strategic? No. Uh, is, can it be useful? Yeah, it can be useful, but it is no way strategic. Um, and, and everybody working on what they think is the thing is not strategic. Um, the lack of predictability for contributors, just thinking in the same context, this isn't just true of core development, but okay, so I would take on those core issues and, you know, hack at them, and it could take a year to get a single stupid thing in, because you've got to get somebody to pay attention to it, you've got to get it reviewed, nobody else might care, you just have all these, uh, people often work on projects, especially in core development, for a really long time, and then 
either they finally get it in and they're exhausted, or it still sits there. So I have plenty of issues that are just sitting out there that just finally got ignored. And that's a terrible thing for us to waste. Uh, there's so another critical problem is the problem that we have when what we call consensus doesn't happen. Um, we have a very poorly defined idea of consensus and it includes anybody who shows up can block progress and that isn't a very productive model. Um, so we have a list of bad things that happen when consensus doesn't come around. We can have nothing happen at all. We can just stop. We have um, feelings hurt and contributors leaving the field. That happens fairly regularly. Um, we have people wasting their energy and then we have the absolute ultimate uh, web chick name smoking crater syndrome where um, it, the, the feelings just get too high in the issue and nobody wants to stay. And, uh, and therefore again nothing gets done which I, th I think one of the critical things that we absolutely have to do is when we have a problem in our, com in our community that needs to be solved we need to solve it and not abandon the field because our model of dealing with it isn't adequate. We need, to, we need to actually solve those things. Of course, we don't have a conflict resolution methodology, which is the same thing. I already said wasted energy and the loss of, the loss of important people because of the, the heat. So just to say a little bit about my own personal experience, which I've, I already have, um, I got here kind of by accident. It's a duocracy. <laughs> I, was, I was talking about burnout at the last DrupalCon and thinking about the causes of burnout and what, what causes us to just burn through contributors. It, I think it's our perception that Drupal is worse about that than some other situations that we've been around. It may or may not be. But the, the comments that came out of that session at London included the fact that people spend too much time, you know, governance related things, that we can't solve problems, that we can't uh, enable people adequately, that people end up too scattered, and that people who are willing to give end up being asked to give too much. Um, those are all uh, governance as well as culture issues. And so that started pushing me toward thinking about uh, governance as it relates to our burnout um, syndrome or, or culture. The second thing that happened was this fall, um, I got involved in a couple of um, conflict resolution mediator type situations. And uh, those are always satisfying on the one hand because if you're successful then people aren't mad anymore and some of us are very sensitive to people being mad and we really would like them not to be. <laughs> but um, they're probably things that could have been resolved by simple um, governance structures that would already have worked in our culture and not need an intervention from a uh, you know, from a mediator type of thing. Plus the mediator in that concept like that has no way, there is no governance structure, there is no conflict resolution methodology. So if you fail, you fail. And uh, there's no, you know, there's no place to go from there. Yeah. Uh, Randy, I'm sorry, just briefly, uh, I Do you, yeah, feel free to use the mic because it's, uh, that way people will be able to hear it. Hi, I'm Forrest Monster on Drupal.org. Randy, um, when you say that we need to solve problems when they arise, uh, does that mean not abandoning them? Because I guess sometimes with some problems you just let them go and they go away. Can you tell me more about, I mean, I don't know, I just later maybe you can comment on that. We need to solve all the problems and sometimes Yeah, so there away. are, that, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, is it totally legitimate to just let a problem exist? Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. Um, the problem, the, the thing that I'm concerned about is that we have a culture that can walk away from problems that must be solved. 
Okay? Not all problems must be solved. I'm worried about the ones that must be solved. And we have lots of them. And a lot of times we don't get them solved because of this, this whole thing. Yeah? Can you think of any examples off the top of your head? Yeah. <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, we don't have much support infrastructure in the Drupal world. Um, we started out with forums because Drupal itself has forums. And we have a few people who carefully maintain the forums. Um, but essentially, people who come new to the Drupal world um, have a really difficult time finding an organized level of support. Um, there are a number of solutions to that, probably. But due to the level of conversation and stuff, it's been a, a very long time, and we haven't been able to even punt and like say, okay, well, Stack Exchange is doing a good job, let them do it, kind of thing. So that, that's an example. Um, an another example would be, the, um, would be the full project application process. We want, want, want to have new developers in our community. We want to make it easy for them to get in, and we want to instruct them on the way in. But the only structure that we've ever come up with is unsustainable. And we haven't been able to make a decision that would make that sustainable because we're just basically like this. And so we, we haven't gotten it, even though we talk and talk and talk. At every DrupalCon, we have a talk about it and we try to solve it, but we haven't actually solved it. We have 400 in the queue again or something like that. So um, those are a couple of examples. Yeah. The, So right now, number two points that Jeremy just made, Jay Thorson, who is like the man who is trying for a technical solution to this problem, and has been, and it's how he got sucked into many, many wonderful things. <laughs> Yay! The, the two things that Jeremy said was that notice that there's no plan stated publicly to talk about that at this DrupalCon. Oh dear, okay, which is another one of those, we're not dealing with it because we couldn't, which basically means we're telling everybody uh, we don't want you, implicitly. Um, so so those, are some, those are some examples. So those good enough examples? So, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. So we do have risks of change and we have to take the change seriously. We have to... We have to work this through and, and be aware um, because our culture is of value to us and governance doesn't like get better just because you, just because you want it to. It's got to work with your culture. Um, so we could offend people with increased form formalization. We could have full bike sheds about formalization. I'm, I'm sure we could. Formalization or increased process however you would want to say it. Um, I actually am not thinking that we need that much in the way of formality. I just think we need a little structure, and I think we can, we can do a lot with that. Um, some people might become passive, you know, the they and the they will take care of it kind of problem. Uh, so we have a duocracy, and right now, if people get involved in the community and they start to realize that they can just take over space, they do. Um, I'm actually not sure that we have to do anything about that either. I think, I think we might be able to just leave that. Our problem is where uh, people try to take something over and they can't. So, for example, if we had um, probably had we not blocked the, new pro the full project application and if we said to, like if we said to Jeremy, look, we're failing, just solve it then we would probably have a solution. Um, you know, his, his solution's a technical solution that got blocked on some things, but, you know, like if you said to me, just solve it, I would, right? I would just say, okay, for now, uh, we're letting everybody in. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'd probably put a little bit of social structure on that, 
but that's, you know, I would just say, until we have a technical solution, we will increase our training level and we'll let everybody in. But I can't do it the way we're set up. So, in other words, I don't think we need to get rid of the duocracy. I think our problem is when we block the duocracy, which I had never really stated that um, very clearly before. Our problem, I think, is when we block the duocracy. So in the two examples that I just said, um, there are at least two reasonable proposals that would deal with the um, support issue, perhaps, um, and, and they're, they, they would work in a duocracy. The problem is they don't work where we, uh, where we block them. So, so yeah, so we don't want too much process. We don't want, oh, Ethel Jensen is about to speak. <laughs> so, we bow down. So, so I just wanted to give, uh, I think those were great examples where, where, you know, formalization. Come a little closer into the mic. I think those were great examples where formalization and empowering people to make decisions would, would empower duocracy rather than blocking duocracy. The count, one counterexample is, I think, you know, the initiative lead structure that we, you know, it's an experiment, right? But the initiative lead structure, one of the unintended negative side effects from it has been that a lot of people have felt like, oh, there's an initiative lead in charge of that. I don't have to get involved. So, and we're, we're trying to figure out how to deal with that now. Okay. So, so Alex is saying that when we have added lieutenants, we're kind of letting the lieutenants do the work, um, which, is a, which is essentially, at the, that's the whole thing of they will take care of it. So, yeah, Angie. In addition to that, well, you said you don't think they will take care of it as that big of a problem, but you noticed also that the conflict resoluter for our community was sitting on your left. I don't actually want that responsibility. And I don't actually want to be involved in the center of every conflict and everything, trying to make people hug. I mean, I have many other things. You've got conflicts of your own. I know, I do. <laughs> and sometimes I'm in the middle of the conflicts, and then that makes me really in a really bad position. So, you know, I, I'm not against formalization because, you know, about that. I think it would be great if we had, I think our number one thing is you, you nailed it. It's we don't have a conflict resolution. Our conflict resolution is literally to do right this later, pretty much. Um, the second thing, though, another negative consequence of the, the formalization of initial views that we know has happened is um, in Drupal 7, it was 1,000 people that all had direct access to Dries and I. I mean, you know, give or take. There were definitely some more equal than others based on their level of contribution. But essentially, you know, I could probably name four or 500 of those 1,000 that I, you know, oh, yeah, that's the person, did, 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 you know. Formalizing initiative leads, which was kind of our first experiment with you know, putting some structure around core development beyond like just identifying maintainers and maintainers of text was you know, really a scaling Dries problem. It was like Dries wants these things to happen. He's going to appoint some people to like go figure it out and I trust you and then you know, kind of that was the theory, right? But the negative consequence of that is a lot of the core developers who are not good at cat herding and are not really somebody that you want in charge of like helping other people on board and stuff like that because they're much better just like crank out code. They felt really disempowered by that and they felt really threatened by that and they felt really like that there's been, I mean we had to hold a big fireside chat in December to like break that myth. It's like no, you don't have to be working on an initiative to make a difference in core. Work on your stuff, you know, like anything you want to work on is still great. We still have the duocracy model. It's just that these things are strategically important and Dries wants to make sure they happen. And so he's like putting people on it to focus on it and try and communicate out to the community better what's happening in core. So it's my nervousness around increased formalization is that every time we've tried to do that, we've like it's it's been really hard and it's had actually really negative consequences on some other things now i think on the whole this was a good thing but i think there has to be some amount of buy-in from people that this is what we want to do because the negatives i think are a little bit not well explained here they're they're, they're very serious and we really have to you know be concerned about them basically. so greg in his talk yesterday on uh on what uh, the learning about bike shedding which was excellent talked about um, ways of improving process without adding layers of responsibility. And so, in a sense, you're saying that there's huge consequences of adding layers of responsibility um, because people feel disempowered and stuff like that. But that's not the only thing that we're talking about here. So, he mentioned time boxing an issue, okay? So, time boxing an issue saying this issue is important 
we are not going to let it die, it must have a resolution by a certain time frame, is not adding a layer of... So, so there's all kinds of finesse that we can do in our structure that is not just adding lieutenants and sergeants and all that kind of thing. It, it's more committing to deal with the things that we ought to deal with and making sure that they don't get blocked by our own culture. So, you know, time boxing, um, perhaps enabling somebody to make a call or creating a way. So in, if in the issue queue, for example, you've got an issue. If we agree as a community how a deadlock in an issue is to be handled, then we have a way to handle it. Sure, we can empower somebody to call it. That's one way. But there might be other ways as well. Krell. Yeah, so on this same topic, um, whether it's formal or informal or whatever, a large part of our problem is, as you said, you know, one person can block any issue. And even when we have someone who is responsible for something, either as an initiative lead, as a subsystem maintainer, as a uh, documentation lead, you know, wh whatever their role is, however formal or informal it is, we don't have a cultural sense that with that area of responsibility comes the authority to do it. And I know people hate the word authority, but you know, if the documentation lead says, we've looked at it and we need to do X for documentation, you know, we need to be able to say, documentation lead has said we need to do X, I'm going to trust their judgment on this, or I may disagree, but they are the person in charge of this, I'm gonna let them do their job. Um, and this is one of the biggest problems with D7UX, that you know, we hired professional designers and uh, UX people to say, you know, look at Drupal and come up with you know, a UX revision, and they ran into a wall of knives from people who didn't trust them to do what their expertise was and what they were hired to do. And you know, a, a, a cultural gauntlet I'll throw down is figure out what area it is, it is where you will defer to someone else who has more expertise. If you do not have such areas, you are doing it wrong. Whatever they are, you know, maybe it's, you know, you'll defer on code issues to these people because you're a themer, you don't deal with the deep code. Maybe it's the other way around, you know, I don't know markup. You know, I, as a module developer, if you're a front end person, tell me what markup you want and I will do it and I will trust you. You know, we don't have that attitude of, you know, there's people with expertise and therefore they are more, more important than me. Their opinion is more important in certain areas than others. And that's different for different subjects. But that is something we don't really have, that trust uh, of other people in certain areas. I agree that we should acknowledge leadership. We should allow for leadership. And uh, we should accept it. You know, I, think, I think we should embrace it. How we do that, how we avoid too much um, authoritarianism or whatever is, is another thing. But I think we should allow for leadership. I, we, uh, we sometimes talk about ourselves like a, uh, like a meritocracy, and sometimes you know we've tended more toward the duocracy word in recent years. But it, there's a reason to let somebody who is respected. I mean, essentially, we let Angie do anything she wants because she deserves it, right? Anything she wants to do, she can do. She deserves it. Well, she shouldn't be the only one, and. She shouldn't, because of that, have to be the only conflict resolver. And she shouldn't, you know, all these things that have accrued to her are actually an over-example of what should be happening throughout the community, where the kind of cred that WebChick has should be spread throughout the community explicitly and deliberately. That'd be my opinion. Chicks, go ahead. Um. Just as you were talking about uh, time boxing and issue queues, it reminded me a proposal that Robert Douglas made six years ago or something, uh, that one way to deal with issue queue abandonment is to make it a queue. Right now, it's just a dumping ground, but if you make it a queue where things go, first things go in, first things go out, so if you want your patch to anything to happen with it, you need to look at, you need to have those that are in front of it. 
just reminding people that there was a. Uh, if we, if so we are making plans of plans, then changing our culture about how we deal with code and the issue queue is an interesting thing. We still have 12 minutes, right? I'm not confused. We're okay. Okay. It's a big no, because I really want the key thing is I want to write down uh, some paths forward. Um, I. I don't want to minimize the fact that needing more governance is a good thing. That means that we've succeeded. Okay? We've done, we've done really well. And I don't want to, I was, I was very much touched by what Effulgencia said about um, that conversation and conflict in the issue queue is not, uh, it, it can be very, very positive. So how do you like that kitten picture, huh? <laughs> so I'd like to make a list. Let me flip back to where. Um, let me flip back to where we are here, and let's see what um, if if Melissa has added to things so that we've got um, so that we're together on this. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, the. I wanted to take a look at this slide and see if we have things to add to it. Way too often, and this is, this is actually one of Dries' problems when he thinks about, um, when he thinks about um, governance, is all he thinks about is core development governance. That, that's it. So you're shaking your head no, so I must be wrong. What's that? Okay, it's totally not true. So forget it, cancel it, I'm wrong. And she knows him a lot better than I do. But every time I hear it come, so just forget that, strike that. What I want, my point is, let's say, what are the areas? The Drupal community is a lot bigger than just core de code development. Okay, what are the areas where we need to have a little, have something more than nothing? So core development is one place. Contrib development is a place. Infrastructure. Security has a bit of governance, which is interesting. There's a bunch of implicit governance in how we do security, and uh, that's well thought out, um, but it might not be stated explicitly enough. Yeah? So the most important role in the security team is a decider of deadlocks. And do you formally have that? So Greg is it. So you've invested Greg. So they have a much more sophisticated um, governance structure. Okay, yeah, so I, I've noticed that security has a relatively, um, ha, has a relatively well thought out model that you could call governance. Yeah, Angie. Uh, the okay, good. Um, look, she says it and it appears. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, security site function and content. Um, you know, I would love for Drupal.org to have a leader who was actually had a plan for what it ought to be in a year. Um, there's probably more than one way to do that. But one reason that Drupal.org is a morass is that it isn't really owned. Um, it isn't really owned by a group that has a plan for it. Um, and of course, it's not just Drupal.org. There's a bunch of others. Now, you could say that like localized.drupal.org does have a, a leader and a plan, and so some of the um, smaller areas do. Yeah? One of the things Dries mentioned in his keynote yesterday around content authoring was a three-step process for, I think, discovery, design, and implementation of improvements to content authoring. Uh, I think we could add when an issue can be blocked to a, a place to improve governance. I know that's also come up in Whiskey should an issue be blocked in the design phase, be it visual content authoring design changes or architectural whiskey style design changes. 
Should an issue be blocked then, or can someone wait six months later until there's a completed patch? Can it be blocked after all that work has been done? Uh, yeah, I agree completely. In fact, I think I've got another slide with some some ideas of the way that we could improve our, just our rules about how we deal with issues. And, and I don't know whether they're, I, I think uh, Dries has been thinking about that and stuff. Um, let's see, uh, there are, uh, when I put community issues, I, issue is a bad word there, but there, there is actually stuff right in the community that is, I mean, we're, we're a big and complex organization that has community issues as well as these ones that can be categorized in other places. Um, support, project application. What other broad uh, subsets of what we call Drupal need to be on this list that we should be thinking about? You can, you can mention them later or add them uh, a little later if you'd like. So I just was doing some speculative thoughts about the core development process. A lot of you here have been involved in it. And I was only doing it because it was a way to think about something that everybody's thought about. And so the initiative or lieutenant concept is obviously something that we have learned something about in the last year. Um, leadership is something that I'd mentioned. But I think what you were saying is like, can we make the design and the committability decisions earlier in the, earlier in the issue. So right now, in a, in a core issue, the, you, there's nothing certain until it goes in. And it might even be rolled back after that. I don't think we're gonna, I don't think we're gonna solve that problem because that's, that's just a normal risk of software development. So that's not, but the risk that you take to spend a year working on an important issue and it could be blocked by a bike shed at the end is a huge risk. So can we make the committability decisions earlier? Is a, is a uh, you know, can we say this design approved um, after adequate design bike shed? You know, commit approved when it's RTBC? Um, in other words, the, the maintainer has signed off on it or whoever's responsible for it has signed off on it. Um, I think that just Finding an explicit way to say this is how a bike shed ends would be a great thing for our community. And I'm not sure exactly what we can do, but I don't think it's very hard. The between the time boxing idea? Yeah, Angie. Yeah. Um, one, one thing we, this came up at the whiskey sprint that we had um, is, is, you know, this, this thing where there's people tearing each other to shreds over like directory structures. You know, there was blood on the floor over directory structures, literally. So the process, in air quotes, that we came up with um, is if something, and ideally this would happen way before there's blood on the floor, but if something is heading in that direction where it's like there are two or more very smart people who have very opposing views on things, the process that we came up with was assign it to Dries. And anybody who's in maintainers.txt for core can assign things to Dries um, I think we can, I don't know the whole permission scheme and everybody, but we could figure that out. And then the goal would be that Dries would then say either this is what we're doing or he would say, I trust Randy Fay to figure out what we're doing here. And then he or the person assigned could also put a time box on the decision. So say, I trust Randy to make this decision. Let's try to have this wrapped up in two weeks or whatever it is. That's the process. We're gonna have to see how this works. It did work with the PSR zero issue. You know, it was assigned to Dries, he was traveling or whatever, but within a week, he com you know, commented back and said, that's what we're doing. And the issue got marked fixed, and I haven't been online a lot lately, but it seemed like it stayed fixed, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Um, but, you know, we have a BDFL, let's use him, basically. Well, that works. Uh, see, that still has the problem that Dries is limited. And and so I would like to see that exact thing um, expanded. And, and so that there were 20 or 30 trusted people in the community who would be close to the problem and who could be more responsive than he can. Let's face it, he can't. I mean, he can't be responsive on 100 issues that might need response. So let me just, um, let me just go to this uh, 
The one thing that I want to come out with, okay, so just at the end here, there's a, a reference to where the resources are because there was some great thinking, you know, like John O'Bacon's book and stuff like that. Um, and I want to, you know, say that you should go and, and write up the session and stuff like that. And the blog posts uh, are listed here, so that's good. But what I, what I really want to do is to take just a couple of minutes and come out of here with a plan of how we could, within our current Drupal world, how we could go forward to build a little bit more structure and implement some of the things we found out that work. A, a, a planning commission for improved governance. How can we do that? And then, and then we'll just run over the time with what you guys have to say. Is that all right? Yeah, um, I, I just have a small point. Um, I think we should have a technical definition of what deadlock is and, and what a bike shed is. Then we can declare that this is this issue is bike shattered. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. Yeah. Go yeah. down a road. Yep, that's a good idea. Yep. Have a have a description of what when it becomes a bike shed. Only if fifty three percent of the people agree that it's a bike shed. So I think it should be fifty four. <laughs> exactly. So are there people in this room who would be willing to work on proposing to the community, thinking through and proposing to the community uh, a more extensive governance strategy. Yeah? Yeah. Um, what we should do is we should, um, we should make an issue for it and have people kind of sign on or we'll figure out something like that. How, how would we do it? Would we just say that we came up with this idea and we have self-appointed ourselves and if you want to join in, you can? Should we have a governance group on, on groups? Oh, where are you going? Oh, oh you're, you're just so polite. Okay, you looked like you had to say it that second. Well, Okay, uh, on the ahead. topic of should we have a governance group, I would suggest we make a core issue and assign it to Dries, and he would then approve or deny the governance group just to model what the, the conflict resolution system Angie suggested. Dries could decide should we have a governance committee or not, and will their proposals uh, have a chance of being adopted. Um, uh, on the idea of scaling the assign it to Dries um, technique, uh, I could see us using an appeal process where if we had a, a larger number of right. people yep. with yep. decision-making authority, it could be the initiative leads, it could be maintainers listed uh, in core currently. We could assign issues to those people, they could make a decision, and if someone still wants to bike shed, there could be an appeal oh, process. Oh, yeah, 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 going absolutely. That's, that's basically what I'm saying yeah. is let's not start with Dries as the solver. Let's end with Dries as the solver. Yeah, to be clear, that's what I meant. I didn't mean if you're bickering over like a little thing, like yeah. a science yeah. I meant these big ones, the, yeah. the smoldering creators, the ones that you point out, like they must be solved. Um, the thing I was going to come in is another great thing that Greg said during his talk in terms of strategies was come in with a proposal. Don't open with, you yes. need to figure yep. out yep. governance. Like the you know four or five people who want to like work on that, get together, you know, ask some people, you know, do that kind of thing, and then come to the community with a proposal. Because then it becomes a, what do you think of this? Right. And then we can say, well, I don't like that aspect of it, or I don't like this aspect of it. But it doesn't become a, well, I think we should do this. I'm you know, trying right. to cat herd all of that. Or, or a, a, a related thing, and this is related, I, this might be exactly what you were saying about what Greg said, is that too often in the issue queue, when you have an opinionated person, they will just say, you can't do that. And we should probably build into our system, into our, into our culture, that you generally work from a what you should do, what we can do, rather than just blocking with you can't. So, but yeah, go ahead. I found that the biggest issue about proposing process to a group of people is, is how you convey that information to the group of people because it's so incredibly difficult for people to consume this much information. And it's also very difficult for people to 
both understand like the the grand scheme and the details of it. So for like in a governance proposal group, you know, their job is like the information architecture of the document of the processes and the details of them so that they're really easy to consume and then to bring them to the community in, in small consumable parts for review uh, so that it's easier for people to consume them and give feedback. Yeah, and I can't see us getting very far with like a document, although that maybe that's where we're going to go. But uh, we're, we're basically out of time, and I want you to go ahead and talk anyway, so we'll just keep okay. talking anyway. Well, but what I propose is this. I think that the issue uh, approach might work for us. And if there's not a governance project, I would propose creating a governance project and uh, talking there. Does that sound crazy? Is that sound, that's all right? Okay. Yeah. I, we can all find it. So if, if it doesn't already exist, then we'll go out and make drupal.org slash project slash governance. And uh, people can make proposals there and sign up to work there. And we can experiment a little bit there and see if we can create some bike shits. So... Yeah, go Just ahead. to play devil's advocate a little bit, um, we already have a code of conduct that no one ever points to that says, hey, you know, you're well, not stepping do. down considerately. But then we're talking about also establishing this you know, governance document kind of thing that, again, maybe not be, people may not be like, oh, you're violating rule like 1.2 of the code, uh, governance code of conduct. Like, I agree that something needs to be done to change that, but we already have this Awesome, awesome code of conduct. Well, the code of conduct right now only deals with culture. And it punts on governance. And that's kind of the problem is that, the, I mean, people do point to it uh, quite often. And I, and I think we probably should more. But it's only for culture. And I think it, it has no conflict resolution in it. It has no what to do when you have a problem in the issue queue. It has no, how do we resolve well, some of the bike onus shed. is on the, the people who have accepted that code of conduct. So, you know, sure, we're in a bike shed argument about, like, what directory structure we're calling it. But some of it's, you know, like, all right, I understand that we're in a rut here and we need to step back considerately. Like, that's, that's a thing that's already in the books. And, you know, I don't know, I, I know that's a big problem in, say, like, our own government, like the United States government, you know, you have... 20,000 rules on the same thing, and we're just adding more rules and more rules to kind yeah, of... Yeah, we don't want to do I'm that. I'm just playing devil's yeah. advocate here. Yeah. I agree that something does need to be done, but... Yeah, thank you. Yep. Carl. I just also want to highlight that different problems in different types of bike sheds need different kinds of solutions. Yep. Um, I mean, there's the issue that is deadlocked because Krell and Chex can't agree, or Chex and Son can't agree, or Son and Damien can't agree, which is a completely different problem space than there's someone in this issue who is outnumbering everyone else in terms of posts two to one and still doesn't know what they're talking about. They may be well-meaning, but they're an issue queue vampire. Both problems exist. I have been involved in both of them. Some would argue I'm on both sides of those, but that's another story. But those are different problems, and we need to come up with ways of addressing both of those, and those are going to be different. Whatever those are, I, I don't know, but those are different problems to solve. See, we still have a duocracy. Because anybody can, could have put a picture on the screen while we're looking at it. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, how, how we resolve, you know, the, the bike shed is different than the issue queue vampire yep. problem. Yep. And I've I seen agree. issues destroyed yep. by both yep. of those. Yep. Oh, Chicks. Um, one thing that kind of works universally in the world, uh, regardless of countries, is, I don't remember the English word for it, is this... Uh, Arbiter, uh, arbiter arbitration, so binding what, arbitration. One thing we could do. <laughs> we could have issues go into binding arbitration. <laughs> yes. I like it. One thing we could do <laughs> is to have. I like uh, it. Like community leaders. So if you have an, like a 
that deadlock that issue, then we could have like community leaders who uh, name arbiters who like, I like know, it. know what, I like what it. they are doing, and then they decide like three or five people who, and then what they decide is the decision. I like it. You could yeah. have a, yeah, I like it. That, and that's very simple and it fits right within our model. It just gives us a way to break it. Yeah, I like it. So, yes, sir. Regarding ideas. Come right up to it so that it. Yeah, you hear me? Uh, I think uh, there is some working model of uh, this multiple level of uh, lieutenants and things I can make decisions. And uh, this working model uh, allows uh, to not have the problem of they are responsible. Uh, I think a lot of sites and uh, communities use this karma slash uh, badges system. So basically, the more you contribute to the community, to projects, the more rights you have. I think uh, that's uh, relatively simple. So the, so the recognition of the structure of our community is another whole thing, which I have opinions about, but I think it's not exactly the same thing. Maybe it is the same thing, but we definitely, I think we need to expose the structure of our community, but I'm not sure it's the same issue, but it might be, it might be. Krell. So just to push back a little on the binding arbitration concept, while I like it in theory, it runs into the problem that, you know, one of the things Czech said, you know, that arbiter should be someone who knows what they're doing. In most cases, odds are the person who most knows what they're doing is one of the people involved. Uh, I mean, if there's some question about, you know, some deadlock in the internationalization system, Gaber is the one who should be resolving that. Odds are Gaber is also one of the people in that debate because he's the internationalization guy, so he's probably in the debate already. And, you know, I don't know what to do with that. That's, that's not, it's not necessarily true. Um, you could take Ethel Jensen and throw him at any one of those and he'd, he'd be a fair arbiter. I mean, there aren't Perhaps. that many people like him, but you could, you could take him, you got it, you promote it, man. You've been promoted. <laughs> Let's yeah, take a bow, Alex. <laughs> but no, so I'm saying it's not necessarily true, but I can understand your point. The impartial expert is, I think, a lot harder to find than we give it credit for because most of the people who would be domain experts are not impartial by the time it gets to that point. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that by now we are large enough that we actually have the kind of experts who could uh, move in. We have actually seen this already happening without a formal structure. Usually what happens is when an uh, issue gets deadlocked, uh, David Rorson gets involved and then things move on. Uh, I have seen that many times actually. Uh, but what I wanted to say is that badges are extremely controversial on Drupal.org because we don't want what you have said, you know, that they are doing this. Right, And right. that badges thing very easily could lead to that, you know, that uh, somebody with this list of badges says something and then uh, the new contributor who actually might know more about it, he's just not much into Drupal, m might be intimidated into uh, not into not uh, doing what is actually the right thing. So I am very much against doing that. Uh, this is also the reason even an IRC free node uh, encourages uh, the ops not to be opt all the time, not to intimidate uh, everybody. Why doesn't everybody come up here and talk that way and use this mic? It doesn't make any sense for you to be looking at me. <laughs> you should need to talk to everybody else. Okay, so one of the points raised was that not having a lot of governance actually empowers people and that by adding new layers and new lieutenants, you are actually making it so that certain people and many people don't feel empowered enough. But m what I would like to argue is that those people are only empowered to solve trivial things and that without having uh, a certain level of governance and without having an issue he wouldn't actually be able to solve big things and to rework large parts of Drupal. And I think that having initiatives has allowed us to rework a lot more than we could have been able before. And I, as an individual, uh, 
am really scared when thinking, for example, of reworking comment module or everything else, because if I try to suggest large changes, I know that it will be bike shedded to death and it will die. And I really don't have the energy to just talk so much and not do so much. So that's my point. Thank you. One uh, mechanism which hasn't been uh, evoked uh, is the one used by the PHP group and um, PHP projects in general, which is the karma mechanism. We have something about karma in uh, the channels, but it uh, isn't used for anything currently, uh, as far as I know. And uh, on PHP projects, uh, the level of karma can give you some rights for, on, for recognition on the project. And using such a mechanism might uh, be useful for us to, uh, for people to obtain actual recognition beyond their, their name. I'm not sure I'm clear about that. You mean uh, when people accrue karma points by doing some things for the community, solving issues or getting in uh, massive patches, some people will know because they follow this. Bouncing too much, I think. I think oh, like yeah. oh yes. <laughs> uh, should I restart? No. Yeah, ka karma. As I said, karma is currently not really used on Drupal except uh, for fun on the channel. But uh, if you look at how it works with the PHP projects, uh, gaining karma points will gain you recognition and actual rights on the, at some points in the system. And uh, currently, uh, when people do uh, in important work on core, like uh, sudden closing node 8, for instance, uh, some people will know because they follow the issue, but many won't. And solving uh, huge issues can uh, give you a, a recognition which could help uh, provide recognition levels for some people who have some expertise or uh, actual level of involvement in the project. I, I thoroughly agree, agree, and I hadn't had that thought that the exposure of our community structure through expressing what people have done in it was part of the governance discussion, but maybe it is, and I think we should consider that. Um, I think we should probably bail um, because we're running out of juice. I'm, I found the governance project doesn't exist. I'm going to create it. Um, please create issues there and We'll sign you up, and Angie, you can have the last word. I just, I just had something really quick, which was a suggestion to the you know, committee, ad hoc committee that sort of works on this, is rather than trying to come up with a big overarching plan for everything, I mean, it seems like we have some really good low-hanging fruit. Like, let's fill out that to-do in the conflict resolution policy. That's right. It's my opinion that because our community is so valuable to us and works very well in many, many ways, that we should be experimenting with little changes and not making big, I don't want to write a Drupal constitution. I think that would be a big mistake. I think we should get community agreement for small changes that will unblock some of our key things. And that may take us somewhere down the line in five years when we're even bigger, but I think we should be doing, looking for low-hanging fruit, addressing it, and finding ways to solve our problems without a huge structural change. But let's do call it, and please do check in. I'll just create that project in a, in a minute or two. Check in there, and thank you very much for your care for Drupal. Thank you for caring. Oh, yeah, don't forget the evaluation. I already said that, but... It's there, yeah. Thanks a bunch.